Well, three very different presentations there, talking uh, ranging from Brexit to data to uh, local CVSs and everything in between. Uh, the time has come for you to ask the panel some questions now. Uh, so, I know it's the end of the day and you're all a bit tired, but uh, I expect at least one question from all of you. We've got about half an hour. So, uh, who uh, wants to start us off? Uh, can you say your name, where you're from? Yes, it looks like a word. Um, I'm Richard Williams, I work for NCVO. Um, uh, I'm from South Wales. Uh, but um, that's a different thing. Uh, Matthew, can I just um, clarify something in my mind? Data is hugely important. But data without insight is absolutely bloody useless, to be honest with you. And so your call for data, I agree with completely. But without the insight, and without actually understanding the outcomes that actually happen to those people and the work that's done with them, I'm sorry, data isn't the answer for everything. Thank you. It's just a statement. Can I, please? I absolutely agree with that as a fundamental principle, which is why I'm making the speech that I am. I think at present we have an enormous gap between those who have the data and those who interpret the data. And the people who will really understand what that data can do and how to interpret it is you, the people that work with those about whom, about whom that data relates. But the problem is, is that those who could really interpret it don't have the skills or sometimes the experience to be able to interpret that data. That's an enormous gap in what we have. And we have to find a way to bridge that gap to make sure that the, the, the data that we have is being properly interpreted by the people that will make most use of it. At the moment, I think, what it requires is some bridging process where, in a sense, you need access to the people that understand what the data is saying in order for you then to explain, oh, OK, if it, I, I can't interpret it, but if the data says that, here's what I think we need to do. And it needs to be that process. Now, we, as a public body, need to help facilitate that. We need to provide the resources to enable you to have some intermediary between the data being interpreted and what your answer is to that data. But absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more and, and the reason I'm putting that call about data out to you guys instead of just to a data store unit or, or group of my statisticians is to say we need you to get excited about the data and be interested when people come to you and say this is what the data says because we need your interpretation and understanding of what the solution is. Lord Kersley. I'll keep my comments very brief, but I think uh, there's an incredibly important bit here about the link between data and evidence. And uh, let me just give you an example of universal credit. Um, a lot of passion um, and individual cases uh, were kind of exhibited in the debate about universal credit. But what we sought to do in Peabody was to actually undertake a piece of research to get some uh, underlying analysis of uh, what was the experience of people on universal credit against a control sample of those who weren't on universal credit. So when we came to make our recommendations, uh, there was a very, very powerful case. We backed it up with individual cases, but it's not enough. I mean, powerful and moving though they were, and they were, um, you have to have, if you're going to persuade government to shift, you've got to have evidence behind that. And it isn't just the evidence in the sense of the statutory organisations. The evidence that you have is crucial uh, as well. Julia? Yes, thank you. I was really pleased to hear you talking about data in the way you do, because I think evidence and knowledge matters. But I think there's another layer beyond that, which is your mapping capability. And it's, so it's the data that you know about people, of course, that really matters. And I think you make an incredibly strong case for how poor we've been at it. We know that for most of the private sector, data, our own personal data, is now more valuable to them than oil or diamonds ever were to anybody else. And we know stuff that we don't treat as evidence in the same way. One of the things I've been struck by in this inquiry is how little we know about what's going on in our communities, how those routes take place. And the people who I suspect do are people in the local voluntary sector who know at a very granular level who's caring for who, who keeps in touch with who, where, where networks are being formed, how change happens. I think we've been a bit over humble about it. I think we need to talk about that as really important evidence and knowledge and link it to the data that Matthew's talking about. Right, time for another question. Uh, 
Hi, I'm uh, Mike Wilde from Mac in Manchester. Um, I'm going to try and cut across a, a few of the points that you've made because I think the data thing is a very interesting one and certainly something we were talking about earlier. Um, there's, there's two sides to that. One is that the information we collect in the course of our work and how we interpret and gain insight into that. And I don't think our sector's well connected enough along those lines. Um, and I think partly that's because we've not had that investment. And it's impossible to get that investment, particularly when, and I'm sure colleagues in the room have had this experience, we are getting rung up by KPMG and PwC and Deloitte, all asking for our data for nothing, as if it's something we can just you know, dish out to them for free and not a, a resource. And that's partly the responsibility of those who are procuring their services to make sure that our in input gets valued. But it's also our ability to shape economies and places, uh, I think is constrained by the lack of um, ability to think and act in that digital joined up connected space. So I get the question I'm, I'm trying to formulate is where do you think, given that we can't get on the agenda politically, where is the space where we can create this conversation about how to get that investment into our sector? Because that would unleash our potential massively. I, I, can we go to Matthew first? Sure. Um, really good question and one that we've been grappling with. Um, we think that the starting point for something like that is um, those who uh, are funders, uh, the philanthropic sector, uh, sometimes it will be those, it, it will be the PWCs and the, and the others um, who are interested in working out how they can make impact into the work of communities. It would be great if we could have government funding for this work and be able to advocate strongly for why uh, governments need to help us collect that data and, and we shouldn't stop um, advocating for that. But realistically, I think it, the message needs to go out from us uh, in, in government positions and from you who are doing the work to say to those who want to really make impact in this sector, we need long-term thinking about what this sector needs to be changed, to be fit for the future. And one of the things that we need is, is a way that you can help train us up in collecting the information we need, helping to share the information we need and gather the information you need. If you at EY or PwC want data about our organizations, potentially because you want to use it for whatever other reason, but, but even, as we all know, because before they want to fund your project, they'll say, where's the data? And you say, what data? I, I'm telling you what a project is. I don't have the kind of data that a financial company has to be able to give to you to show what we've done. I, I don't have that. And they'll say, well, we're not used to dealing with it if you don't really have that kind of information. It's hard for us to make a judgment. So if they want to be able to work out where that, where that information is, and how they can get the return on their investment when it comes to providing resources for this industry. They need to invest in allowing this, this sector to skill up in terms of its ability to cope with the future. On one final point on this, I wanted to say, I, I deal with community services in a range of areas, including sports, for example. I, I help community sports organizations as well as the voluntary sector. And across all those organizations, at the roundtables I've been having and the places I've gone over the last year, when we talk about needing to skill people up with data, one of the things that we say, it goes on to Julia's point, which is that if you're in that small organization some, in some far-flung corner of outer London, and you are busy trying to, to get funding for your work or, or get people to notice what you're doing, sometimes a conversation is, we're doing really amazing work that's being ignored, and, and please keep funding us, because although we're not on your radar, it's really great work. But one of the things that those organizations have that are enormously valuable is they have data that no one else has about a community that no one knows about. And that, to use the business analogy, is enormously valuable because a unique, a special data that no one else has is of huge value. So understanding the value of that data, that that data has to public sector organizations when they're trying to crunch down on big data is vital for you understanding and them understanding the value of your organization and the return on the investment when they try and fund it. You are looking into great detail. We are looking into funding, of course we are, how could you not? I mean, that's a huge issue to look at. But I wanted to approach it from a slightly different point of view. I don't think there's ever much funding in how you acquire knowledge. 
I think there's huge interest in how you help shape places, how you help build a strong, vibrant economy, how the health economy works, you know, depending on your subject matter and what you're concerned about. And I think we need some pride and some confidence in the knowledge we bring. I think when we use the word data, although I understand precisely how we're using, we also need to recognize it's knowledge. It's stuff that has value. And that's why we're valued around the table, because we know things. We're not pleading. We're actually contributing. They can't do a lot of this without us. Um, and I think we need to think much more about how indispensable we are to some of those big agendas. That's how I, in the end, think funding appears. Lord Kersley. Yes, I, I think um, if we wait for a national government at the moment to give your attention, you could be waiting quite a while, I, I'll be frank with you, because um, uh, uh, as you've seen, things are, um, are not getting any easier on the Brexit front. Um, uh, so I think the answer's got to be working locally, and it may be with the local authority, I think that's important, but actually there are local players who can be just as valuable, I think, in that collaboration. Universities have considerable uh, capacity to analyze and support, housing associations do. Um, and indeed, I think the church often can be part of that conversation as well. So in your shoes, I would be looking to create local collaborations um, with organizations that can bring expertise, capacity, longevity, if you like. They are anchor institutions alongside yourselves to, um, to, the, to the agendas you're working on. Great. We've got a question just here at the front. Thank you. Um, I'm Sally Young. I work in Newcastle in Gateshead. Um, we've heard quite a bit about the new or potentially changing state um, supposedly being facilitating and empowering. And we've heard about digital and data, and I suspect quite a few of us tend to use stories um, when we're telling you know, our, our history, our mapping. And I think what Richard said before about trying to wrap it, um, for me, and I suspect a lot of other people in here, it's something about the, I would say, community values and the moral purpose, because unless we have that, we might as well just go home. So given all of that, what we're seeing um, for our member organisations is that many of them are doing really tough things during really hard times. And how, to, to me, it's something about helping them operate and grow. Um, and just to reflect back on, on what Bob was saying, because I think there has been quite often um, a reaction from local government, and I believe very strongly in place, um, that it tries to hold on to the power. So, uh, you know, we're not seeing what was originally called double Devo. And in my area, we don't even see Devo. Um, so it's, it, and I'm muddling things up a bit, it's, it's how to help those organisations. Because I think there's also a danger of if we look too much and too at ourselves, we're not actually helping the people who most need it in those areas of needs, whether it's thematic or geographic. And I just think we can get into too much of an internal conversation. There's something to me about um, what do we do for the next round, if I can use that, of social action. I don't mean funding rounds. I mean, whatever happens in the future, because it's obviously going to be different. Organisations that are coming to us now are very different to the ones that came to us 10, 15 years ago. People want to do something. They don't want to set up a charity or a, a cause. It's the thing. Well, it is the cause, actually, and not about the charity. So there's something about our response in that time of difficulty. I'm sorry that's a splurge. Um, there's been a lot of stuff thrown at us today, which has been really interesting. But to try and take a path through it to make sense for those organisations we support. Do you, do you want to just clarify the question you are about to ask? It's, it's trying to pull together the stuff about data, the stuff about place, and the stuff about social action. Because I think there's a matrix beneath it, and I can't quite see what it is. That's a tough one. Julia, you go first. I'm glad you asked Julia. <laughs> I'm moving my fingers like a good call. <laughs> Just thinking. I don't think there's automatic leadership in any place anymore. I don't think there's an automatic sense of who's in charge. And I think that's one reason we all feel frightened. I think in different places we have different leaders emerging and different organisations emerging. And I think we'll be tested in... 15, 20 years' time, we look back on this period by how well we manage those changing relationships. 
because there's been a huge onslaught on local government. The local authorities have lost so much money. I mean, I know local authorities where they have far, fewer, far less research or data capacity than some of the organizations around them. We have to recognize the changing power relations, the changing trust dimensions. We don't trust local government. We don't trust housing associates. We don't trust voluntary organizations. We're all having to work for that trust and earn it time after time again. And I think that's part of why we're all feeling so uneasy which is why I end up talking about mapping and understanding, having a really fine-grained knowledge of what's happening in your place, because I think that's gold dust. Like you, I tell stories, it's the way I think. You know, knowing what's happening and what's really going on gives you power that many other people haven't got and gets you a seat at the table. Um, and I don't know where it's going to end. I think I see, because I travel all over the country, hugely different experiments taking place, some really imaginative and good stuff, some really tricky, not very pleasant stuff. You know, you hear chief executives talk about my only task is to, what's the phrase, get a grip on my council, and others who recognise that actually the things we're dealing with now are too difficult for that, that they need different sorts of partnerships. And I think your question is a really well-made one because it's hard to articulate what it is, but social change, it doesn't belong only to the voluntary sector. Leadership doesn't only belong to some of the people who are democratically elected or in some places elected on a very small platform of democracy. It's a much more shared thing, and I think that's harder to navigate. I think it's potentially much more fruitful. And if you think social change is what matters, I think it's the only way to do it. I'd really like to pick up Bob's point about the other institutions. Those organizations that have really deep roots in places have also forgotten that place matters to them. And I talk to housing associations, I talk to universities, I talk to the church, I talk to all of those organizations which have supply chains and procurement chains and recruitment and a sense of identity with a place. And you know, we need to wake them up. They've got a real responsibility in those places. Yeah, absolutely right. Some have bluntly become too grand and need to re be reminded about where they started from, actually. Um, to be very frank about it, I'm not going to name names. Um, uh, not least because you're sitting here, Anne. <laughs> Andy. Um, um, but um, I, I just wanted to build on this point about leadership, because in many ways, most people who know Sheffield will know it went through kind of austerity ahead of most other places because of the severe financial challenges it faced following the student games. And in many ways, that was a period in which the voluntary sector, community sector came forward. It filled in, if you like, some of the gaps. Um, and uh, we had a leader who was from, actually from the Citizens Advice Bureau, and she got into politics, Jan Wilson, who was a terrific leader, because she said um, she was constantly complaining about the council, and the, somebody said to her, well, if you're so unhappy, why don't you get involved? And I think there is a bit about, actually, how much do you think about political action as well as community action? That's gonna be part of the conversation. The second part I'd make is that um, the thing I learned was the extent to which community organizations can do quite extraordinary things. Uh, we used to do something called Out and About, Jan and I, where we walked around Sheffield and met organizations. And I can never forget going to a part of Sheffield where there were, we met two um, mums with their children there who were in a, uh, an old closed down school. Um, and they said, well, we're gonna open up an early years club, a tiddlywinks club. And I thought, oh my God, there's no chance that's gonna happen. Three years later, I went to the opening. And the point I'm making here is that leadership can, uh, it happens at all levels. Um, and I used to have a picture on my wall of me, Jan, and the person who set up this club, because actually that's how I saw the leadership of Sheffield in many ways. Right, let's move on to another question. Um, to the back. Gentleman at the back. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Jake Ferguson from Hackney CBS. Um, thanks for your honesty as a, a panel. What, one of the things that um, we really wrestle with, and I'm sure colleagues in the room do as well, is that when we do all the things that you guys tell us we need to do, or we come up with these great new ideas, the biggest challenge we often have is how we get those mainstream. So, give you an example. We're part of uh, the big lottery talent match um, program, doing some really great work to get over 200 young people into work by taking a youth work approach. Because a lot of our young people are not going to rock up to the job centre because they've had such a crappy experience. 
Um, similarly, we're doing a lot of work for the CCG and the council around sexually transmitted diseases because people are not going to go to certain places to pick up condoms. So we are now funding small African community organizations to be the eyes and ears and brokers in their communities. So we're doing everything we can to be inventive, um, business minded, all collecting data, all those things. But the problem we get is when we've got a good product, and I'm sure many in the room have equally brilliant products, is that we can't get them mainstreamed because mainstream society is not ready for the innovation often, or their commissioning structures are such that they're so traditional that it doesn't allow for a lot of the good practice we've all got in this room to go further than the grant aided project that uh, a fantastic funder gave us the money for in the first place. So I'm really interested in all your perspectives, particularly a media perspective as well, about how we get our good practice mainstreamed. Matthew? Um, I think the others here are probably better are able to answer that than me, but I can tell you from my experience. Um, we uh, are, are always trying to ensure that if there are good practices out there, we can mainstream them. And so, to some extent, the, the perspective I've had in the year I've, I've been with the GLA is to work out during the course of the year, what are we going to mainstream? What are the best practices out there? What are we going to work more closely with? You can't mainstream them all. So if you've got, if you've got 30 great innovations across London and you decide, well, let's run with these three, for the next year and really embed them in our work, you're gonna get 27 people who are gonna feel like, why aren't you, why aren't you mainstreaming our stuff? Um, so that there's always going to be a dilemma in relation to that, but, but being on the lookout for what are the right ideas and being flexible enough to change and adapt from what you may have embedded in your organization over one administration and then needing to switch to be able to incorporate something that a new administration thinks is good it, it is, not, is a challenge, that agility is a challenge. But, I mean, it, it just touches, finally, uh, all I was going to say on that is it, it, it touches on one of the points that was made a, a moment ago, which is that we're quite keen to make sure, and I, I think probably I've, you've, you've personally been in meetings where I've said this before, we're quite keen to make sure that we encourage a real diversity of the size of organisation, the types of innovation, the type of proposals that are being put forward to us when we're procuring ideas or commissioning projects to make sure that we're not going to one or two big providers who've got the same idea they've been having for the last few years, even though that can be really easy to fund because you know what you're getting. The reality is, is that unless you are listening to those smaller, more agile, sometimes much newer voices and organizations within the community who are responding to something immediately on the ground, you're not going to be able to keep up with the needs that are there. So I think all, all I can say is, find keeping a close relationship with community organizations so that you can know what's out there in terms of innovation and then having budget time and resources aside to be able to try and mainstream what you think will work <coughs> is the only way you can do it and you have to try and set up your public authority in a way that can accommodate that but it, it, it's certainly not easy it's a challenge Julian that's a very good question Jake and I suppose it's one I keep hearing but I feel as I've been hearing it for a very long time and it sounds different now from when I heard it 20 years ago how do we get our ideas into the mainstream because I don't anymore know what the mainstream is our level of services in different cities is now so variable and so different I mean our food banks mainstream they happen in every single neighbourhood I can think of. I don't want them to be mainstream. I want people to be able to pay for their own food. I think it's almost heartbreakingly hard to decide where those barriers are now. I think the thing that troubles me, however, is that funders and commissioners, you know, we know this, we'll always go for the shiny new bauble, won't they? You can see them always getting excited. And there is an appalling sense in all voluntary organisations of reinventing and reinventing. And we're all weary of doing it, and I completely hear you on that. But just now, we are trying to design services or activities for completely uncertain times. And my problem with the outcome-based approach to funding, or indeed the, you know, the sense that one administration or another will be interested, is that we don't know what we're gonna need next. We do know that ideas shouldn't go out of fashion because of course you need to be doing the work you're doing on sexual health or whatever else. But I don't know where it would be if it was mainstream because there is so much such a shortage of secure and stable activities. 
the area I know best personally is about services for people with learning disabilities. The mainstream services are not the ones they were. They are completely different now, and we're all fighting in that space, which isn't an answer. And I'm sorry if you thought we were lecturing you, because actually I think what we're talking about is how difficult this is, not how easy it could be. Do you want to Very briefly, I think there's no, I think what Julia's is saying is there's no safe haven now called the mainstream. I, I, I go around not government, and I see all of them, fund very few things stay as they are, if you see what I mean. In terms of getting sustainability behind uh, proven examples, I think the evidence is critical. We've heard that earlier. Um, what People know what works, I think, is pretty critical. I guess the other thing is about getting other people to champion um, what you've achieved as well. If they own it as well, I think that's often the key in local authorities. And the tricky bit for them is that when the resources are just strapped down, the natural instinct is to go with what you do now. And somewhere or other you have to persuade them that the risk of staying with what they do now is bigger than the risk of changing. And I think a key bit of that is to get them engaged in owning the project as much as you own it, really, I guess. That's my experience. But do you think with government that there's a real reluctance to look at local level projects and say, hang on a minute, this could be a great thing to roll out nationally. I mean, oh, completely. And, um, mentioning no names, but if you've ever tried to change DWP on something, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, this, I couldn't resist that. Really, I mean, they have they have, they have a very strongly held view that they have the answers and they have masses of data that they think believe, proves that. Yeah. Um, and so it is incredibly hard, which is why. I see kind of devolution and localism going hand in hand because if you can get devolution to local level of some of these functions, then there's a bigger chance, I think, of uh, locally based solutions and innovation coming forward. It's, I just think in the, in the way that we run a lot of this as national monoliths, it's incredibly hard to break through. Okay, great. Got a lady at the back. I'm Karen Morton from Reading Voluntary Action. Um, listening to the talk about data, I was reminded of, the, I think it was called Think Smarter, Think Voluntary Sector, which was a publication by the government a long time ago, and it's obviously not ringing any bells. But I think it was talking at the time about the Heineken effect. There was this realisation that, that local government, government generally should be seeking out the voluntary sector much more carefully because of the ability of the voluntary sector to reach people that really needed to be listened to. And it sounds to me as though that's a bit similar to the call for data, that actually there's a, there's a dialogue there and an understanding. But of course the voluntary sector is within communities. It's driven by local people and communities. And listening to some of the discussion this afternoon about what's happening with commissioning, I think that document drove then a whole wave of change which has led us to the competitive situation that we're in at the moment and the sort of strange commissioning tendering environment that's really mitigated against the work of infrastructure organisations like CVSs who have been sometimes successfully reinventing themselves but have really very commonly been disappearing and in those organisations is the leadership that enables the voluntary sector to have a face-to-face -face sensible conversation with the public sector in a particular area. So I guess I'm interested in this panel's view on how in an environment where competitive commissioning competition, not talking to people, undermining partnerships, that you know that's a reality, the loss of infrastructure organisations, how we renegotiate a relationship with the public sector that's along the lines of, you know, we're all trying to achieve something very similar here. We're all actually facing very, very similar constraints and difficulties. Can we just start talking to each other like grown-ups rather than ending up with you deciding that we're not in your supply chain? That feels a bit more like a statement than a question. <laughs> It's a bit of private pain, isn't it, really? And I, I get that. And I think um, the bit I feel you need to have win the argument with at local level is to say that the voluntary community sector performs more than simply a, a delivery of services, that it should be a strategic partner 
and that you invest in the infrastructure because it gives you better results for the place. And that is very hard to frame within a commissioning contract. Um, that's one of the issues, I think. And if, so it seems to me there has to be a distinct way of looking at the strategic role of the voluntary community sector and uh, infrastructure organisations that sees them, as, uh, sees them relationship with the local authority as different from the one they might have when they're commissioning services. Now that's a kind of subtlety that passes, a, I'm afraid, quite a lot of local authorities by, but I think that's the way it has to be argued, because if you don't, you will get into a very functional relationship and you'll miss so much of what the voluntary sector has to bring, has to give, if you like. Matthew. I mean, uh I, I think we're, we're moving to a world where um, a, a smarter approach to um, the voluntary sector was considered to be some kind of clever, innovative way of determining who should get funding. And we're moving into a, a, a situation where that, that sort of attempt to try and um, find some new technique has given way to the normalization of big data and information as a way of driving services, and we can't put the genie back into the bottle. That's the way we're going to be assessing how, what results people are able to provide for their communities that they're in, and also it's going to drive more and more the way algorithmic decisions and other types of public policy decisions are going to be determined, even if, hopefully, we build into all of that decision-making process the human element, which is about properly the human stories that underpin that information. So, so I think with that in mind, the challenge is, how do you make sure you're not in a competitive, competitive race where everybody's shouting loudest about, look at my numbers, and you've got a situation where the human story can be incorporated into that process? And I think probably what I would say about that is that it really is about empowering those who have that information, as we've been saying, to be able to find the best way of presenting it, but also to provide infrastructure support on, on that digital side. Your digital work is not a separate bit of your work. It's not some separate part of your job. It is the job itself. All of these things sit together. And I think if we're talking about infrastructure, we also want to be talking about how information can be shared between groups so that they can collaboratively put forward proposals that say, look, we can, we can bottom out and verify why this, why this works within our communities. These aren't just anecdotes. These are verifiable propositions that we're putting forward that would make these communities stronger and better. And we can do this by collaborating across a range of different groups that are showing a combination of aggregate data and aggregate information, aggregate knowledge that, that enables you to be confident about what we're doing. I mean, fundamentally, we have to make sure that we are sharing that information in the most effective way to the benefit of all the organisations involved. So that's why, you know, one of the roundtables I had really early on on poverty was about, I had two, and one of them was just about organisations that were dealing with poverty, um, talking about how they share information, citizens advice saying, look, we, we, it's for us to tr start sh freeing up some of the information we've had for years in order to share it with other groups here so that they understand better the information we at Citizen Advice are getting, and they can use that in their work. And so I think, I, I think hopefully we're moving to a situation where if we can empower you to be able to do that collectively, you're getting much more out of it than some kind of other way around competitive process where, where some um, public body says, if you don't have the numbers, you don't get the money, which right. is what was happening before. I'm conscious Sorry. of time, so I'm going to bring in Julia. Well, thank you, Karen, for that question. Um, about 20 years ago, I wrote a book called The Grant Making Tango, and in it I talked about the three ways of spending money, if you, had, if you had it. And one was giving, and one was shopping, and one was investing. And I described most public authorities as really poor shoppers. And I think what you've described is a really poor relationship between a customer and um, somebody who's got something to sell. I think that the risk has been in the 20 years since that, that all the effort has gone into procurement, and we've come up with some of the nonsense of algorithmic procurement, which was never intended to govern things like place shaping, or building resilience, or responding to floods. Part, there, I think there is a place for tendering some pieces of work, and I think the private sector do some of that well, and some voluntary organisations at some time do. the core of the relationship completely fails to understand, A, the equality between the partners there, and the fact that the money is no longer all in one place anyway. 
Most local authorities are searching for money just as much as any of the rest of us in this room are. So it's a false relationship. And I'm interested to hear what you say because I know where you're working. As I go around the country, I hear more and more people saying we're just not in that game anymore. And that's true of big provider charities. I spoke to a group of them last week where they had a civil society futures conversation, as you must. And they were saying, you know, I don't think we're going to be doing this contract work anymore. We're going to do other things. Because actually our task is to provide a platform for the dispossessed, a place for people to come together and discuss difficult issues, a place to really talk about the things that matter, not to deliver a service to a local authority. If you have your own community assets, it seems to me that gives you more leeway to make those choices. That's why I particularly like the project in Bristol where we hosted one of our events because they had, in effect, an asset that was theirs to manage and oversee. Can I ask a question about that? Can I ask a question of the panel? <laughs> um, <laughs> as long as it's brief, because we have real time. Um, so, so the, oh, one of the challenges that's interesting um, is, is perhaps how do you make sure that those com- organisations that have assets but ne- aren't necessarily modernising, developing, nimble, how do you make sure that you don't cause those who are, have a historic advantage because, for example, they have assets? have some long-term advantage over those who are emerging, coming up with innovative ideas of the sort that Jake was talking about. That's, that, I mean, I'm genuinely curious about that dilemma. There is a risk. Yeah. There is a risk that it becomes it, the incumbents are the ones with ha- which have assets. Yeah. Actually, it's people with power who make decisions about that. We have to start giving assets to some of the challengers. We have to encourage the incumbents to be open to new ways of working. Yeah, that's exactly it, really. Um, part of the answer is to keep the process of transferring assets going um, first of you um, as well as challenging existing asset holders right we've got time for one final question oh 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 oh, oh, oh. sorry sir it's going to be the gentleman at the back uh, hello my name is Kadi Umadi I'm chief executive Merton Voluntary Service Council um, we've been talking about about the future and social action. Um, My contention is that whilst the voluntary sector is trying to adapt and change and and, um, civil society is trying to adapt and change, um, isn't it the problem that the public sector is very slow to adapt and change? Bob Kersley. Ah. My, the difficulty with giving you an answer about the public sector is, of course, it's not all an homogenous whole. Uh, that's the truth of it. Um, and I think local government has gone through massive change and upheaval in the last five years. Bear in mind it's lost uh, between a quarter and a third of its underlying spending capability. That's necessitated very big uh, changes in local government. I think the question for really is about whether they've they've gone through organisational change, but have they achieved cultural change? Have they recognised that they could deliver differently and better if they work collaboratively with others um, for their place? And I think, if I'm honest, it's uneven, it's patchy, and I think there's a lot of work to do there. Um, and as with anything uh, in local government, if you can demonstrate examples where it works, where a different relationship um, with the voluntary community sector, with the community, gets you better outcomes for that place. Over time, I think that will prevail, but it's quite slow, I would get that. So yes, they've gone through huge change, but have they rethought the model? The evidence, I think, Julia, some have, but not enough. And I'd say that's true about the voluntary sector too. I don't think we should be too smug about how we've coped with change. I think there are brilliant examples. Probably many in this room, I'll say that because I'm talking to you. And there are some really sleepy organisations that are still doing what they've always done, getting what they've always got. And that's what happens. That's, you know, we're talking about a time of change. It's scary for many people. It's scary for everybody. And we know, all the research evidence tells you, that when there's uncertainty, people go back to where they feel safe. They don't make good decisions, they make safe decisions, and I think that's true in all sectors. But not in this one. I agree. You agree. (laughs) (laughs) That's not a very good thing to end on. (laughs) Well, 
Our time has come to an end, so uh, if you could all put your hands together and thank the panel for their contribution. And can I welcome...